kind of new Indiana Main Street Outreach and Organization Manager. Um, I was previously in this role um, not too long ago, so I'm really excited to be back um, and really glad to see some of your faces. Um, so I'm also really excited um, that Kelly Hummerkauser is here with us this morning um, from Main Street America. Um, Kelly is the Director of Government Relations for Main Street America, so really her role is uplifting and advocating for Main Street to policy and decision makers. Um, so we're really excited that she's here talking about how to move the needle with decision makers and we know that's a conversation that a lot of you are are having and wanting to learn and understand more so i'm really excited um so with that being said um feel free interact ask questions um the chat is open um and i'll let kelly kind of um guide from there but yeah i'll pass it over to kelly well thanks everybody and i'm sorry i'm like moving things around on my screen so i just want to say up front um, I've got like the presentation on the screen, then I've got you all on a screen. I've got notes on a screen. And if I'm moving them around, if I'm looking over here, it's because like the notes are up there. So I just uh, apologies in advance if it looks like I'm looking away. Um, but uh, again, my name's Kelly. Um, I've been with Main Street America for six years in a variety of different roles. So at certain points, I've served as a Main Street coordinator. I've uh, helped in, in organized conference activities, educational activities. And for the entire time I've been there, I've had a hand in kind of government I'm, relations and you should I'm sorry. Hand. Try signing in again. Just go completely on. Hi it. everyone. Just go make sure that the you phone. have go muted in. your microphones. Cool. OK, it's cool. Sorry, sorry I, I just wanted to pause and make sure we weren't getting. I do encourage uh, folks to speak up if, if you have a question. So no problem if you do come off mute and want to say something. But uh, again, been with Main Street in a variety of roles for six years. I have a background in historic preservation. I actually live in Ohio and find myself in the state of Indiana often. Um, and I'm a Hoosier because I am getting an, a, another master's degree at the O'Neill School at uh, at Bloomington. So I'm kind of I'm kind of an Indiana person. I don't know. So it uh, makes sense for me to, you know, be talking to you about these topics because I'm often actually talking about these topics with other people. Um, so we are going to talk today about um, strategies to move the needle. Uh, yeah, if we've got other O'Neill people, I'm, I'm sure they're throughout the network. We'd love to just chat sometime. So, um, uh, but we are going to talk about um, strategies to move the needle with decision makers. Um, you know. Uh, this is mostly obviously within the space of government relations, right? But it also, there's some things here that are applicable no matter who the decision maker is, right? Because we all have the things that we need to approach and attack and try to, to facilitate change, right? Because there's a status quo and we want something different. Um, so I um, am going to kind of talk about this in, in somewhat general terms, but we can also get into specific scenarios if you want to discuss. I, I, I happy to like comment on a specific a specific thing that you're experiencing so um jumping off okay again what we're going to talk about is problems it's all tangled up right on the other side of it there's solutions and in the middle there's probably somebody that you need to influence somebody that's going to help you make that change right and if i talk about decision makers i might also talk about them as your target audience right who is that person who is going to be able to help you organize that process that you need to get through, that you need to sway in order to, to take the next step. Now, Main Streeters have a variety of problems. I don't know that we need to necessarily go down the rabbit hole of talking about all of them. You're more than welcome to share something that's going on in your community that you are trying to move the needle on. But that can be funding for your program. That could be something that's happening at the state level that's influencing what's happening at the local level. That could be something that's happening at the national level that's influencing what's at the local level. Most of what we're going to talk about is probably more state and local focused. Um, but also, you know, Main Street America does uh, work on federal issues. And so I'm happy to also um, talk about anything that might be coming up like that for you so that we're aware. Um, but really thinking through, you know, there are situations in communities around zoning, around transportation issues, around folks in the community and homelessness, right? Things that are happening on our streets, right? We have a lot of a lot of different issues that we can approach. And so this is a general framework for approaching those issues, not necessarily an issue specific conversation. 
So I'm gonna to suggest to you seven strategies for moving that needle, right? I'll just go through them quickly here and then we'll dive into each. But the first is just lean into the Main Street approach. You have a solid support framework that you're, that's already around you. So how can you utilize that best, right? The second is to become an issue expert. If you want to, to change something, you really do have to delve in and understand the, the, the idiosyncrasies of that if you wanna be the leader on that. There's also obviously ways to partner with others, right? And lend your voice to another group or organization, but it's always your responsibility to understand how it's gonna impact Main Street. You wanna set SMART goals uh, for your outreach. Um, so that's just making sure that when, when you're identifying that issue, you you, we, I'll talk about this maybe a couple of times, but you want to avoid the rabbit hole, right? We're going to focus on one issue, and you have to be focused if you want to if you want to create change, um, because you have to choose wisely about what you're going to what you're going to go after. We want to also think about becoming a process expert. So, in addition to understanding what the issue at hand is, it's important to understand how that issue actually can go through a change process, right? We can't just uh, suppose that we'll throw it out there and somebody will take it from there and make sure that it goes through all the hoops for us, right? So we have to we have to dig in and understand what those hoops are. Um, most, most importantly, probably, is identifying allies and building a coalition. And I think specifically, there's a thought process about that locally, right? When you're identifying those local allies, who are they? But then also, if you're thinking about something that's happening across the state, how do you frame Main Street as part of other coalitions? How do you understand where Main Street sits with other groups and, and propose that value to them as well? Then we'll have a brief, a brief moment to talk about understanding the opposition. It's important. It's a little bit, you know, it's it's difficult sometimes. You don't necessarily want to want to talk about it, but there are people that will be opposed to you. And, and how can you kind of recognize that and be prepared for that. Um, and then our last section is really about crafting and sharing a message. And that's uh, that's my favorite part because that's when you're actually getting the message out there. So I just want to note up front, I do not mean to propose these as a linear process, right? Like we're not, we don't necessarily have to uh, do all of these things in this order. But I do think that it's important that we understand maybe one through six before we start talking about it publicly a little bit but you gotta be able to talk about it a little bit in order to build the allies. And so there are overlaps between each of these things, right? So we're gonna delve right in um, into leaning into the Main Street approach. Um, most of your organizations probably have somewhat of a similar structure to this, right? You have a board of directors, an executive director, maybe, maybe other uh, part-time staff, but um, most Main Street programs across the country have limited staff. A, an active board of directors, hopefully a working board. And then while we, we have experienced more flexibility with committee structure, right? Still there's, there's most organizations still have kind of the main street four, four point committees, you know, across economic vitality design promotion organization. So what's important to note here is that this structure is inherently grassroots, right? You have a constituency of people in your community, the volunteers, the business owners, the residents, they're on your distribution lists, right? You're reaching out to them about events. You're reaching out to them about things that support Main Street. So they can also be a constituency to support any sort of change-oriented goals that you have. It's also important, I think, particularly for executive directors, right, to recognize where the other strengths of the organization can come into play when helping you with a change message. Beyond just you doing all the work, you pushing it, right? How can you lean on and utilize the connections that maybe your economic vitality committee has to make the case for, you know, funding for Main Street for economic development priorities, right? Or if you're looking at zoning, do you have expertise on your design committee that can help you formulate what the Main Street approach to that should be or make connections with people? Um, there are a lot of different ways that you can utilize the people that are already in your organization to help move these goals forward and utilize your board of directors. They are hopefully well-connected in the community and they are what you call your grass tops. Grass tops in, in advocacy language is when you have uh, folks who have strong connections already to decision makers, right? There's two ways to go about change. It's 
very similar to like fundraising, right? You can connect with, you know, a hundred people and try to get them to donate $10, or you can connect with one person and try to get them to donate $10,000, right? Same thing a little bit with using your grass tops connections. It might be possible that your board has a really strong connection. So while you could get a lot of people to sign on to a petition, you might also be able to motivate that one conversation that needs to happen between a board director and somebody at the county, at the city, at the state, right? Um, you know, that that kind of recognition of who has those connections is extremely important. So it's really important to kind of make sure that the whole organization is working towards what the change orientation goal would be. And so there's some questions, right, to think about, right? If you're if you're approaching this, you could take them back and think about them within your organization. Um, your organization likely has work plans. Is there a work plan for whatever this process is, this change orientation, right? Is it do you have a, and we'll talk about goal setting too, but do you have a work plan that includes any sort of advocacy, outreach, decision-making change formats around it, right? If you are taking a position on an issue, does your board fully support that, right? You have to know whether or not, particularly maybe your board chair is going to back you up if you take if you take a position publicly. I have seen situations before where you know, folks have gotten into a little bit of a rough zone when they've made a, a taken a uh, made a statement, taken a stance on something, but didn't necessarily know whether or not they had organizational support for that stance in advance. There's you as an individual, and then there's the whole organization, right? Um, who is that organization designated spokesperson? Um, particularly if you had a variety of different issues that you were that you were interested in approaching, you should have one person, and it doesn't have to be you, and that's what's most important when we're leaning into our, our board and, and making sure that we're using the full structure of Main Street, but is there somebody who is the person who is speaking about that issue, who is super well informed, who knows what the pain points might be when we, we'll get there when we talk about opposition, but is there a person who who is empowered also to make comments on behalf of the organization? Again, that does not need to be you, but if, if you have a, an intern or a volunteer on the phone and somebody calls up and says, hey, what does Main Street think about this new city ordinance, right? Does that person know who to point the reporter to so that you guys don't miss up, mix, mix up your messages uh, on, on where you see something going? That's, that's very important. Um, again, are there board members who can help elevate the issue? That's just the grass tops things, right? So. It, it doesn't just need to be board members, but those are the folks, right, that you want to look to and say, hey, y'all, who do you know around this? Can we map that out a little bit? Can we do a little stakeholder mapping to understand where those relationships are and really make a planned approach? Don't just say, oh, Joe knows that guy. Let Joe go do it. Think about the timing, right? Should Joe talk to that person maybe just before the council meeting where that will come up, right? Or should it be kind of a longer conversation in advance? Um, so use those use those connections wisely um, and because you don't want to overexploit as well. And then how do you how do you assess your efforts, right? We'll talk about this in, in the goal setting section as well, but you know, you you have to understand if you're gonna if you're gonna kind of create a work plan around something, what winning can look like for you. It might not just be this full-on change that you're trying to pursue with a decision maker, it could be incremental. It could be something that you've moved the needle a little bit on and you're going to continue it long term, right? It could just be getting to having really great talking points about an issue, right? Not necessarily even making the full change, but just really honing in on what you want to achieve. Okay. So that's kind of the basis. You want to get your organization oriented, right? And you also want to become, as I mentioned, an issue expert. If you are going to persuade others, if you are going to create media around this, if you're going to talk to a reporter, if you're going to be able to talk to people who are opposed to you and convince anybody and convince a decision maker, you've got to do some some localized thinking, right? There's um, we'll talk about ways to think about this from best practices, and you know the Main Street context is always. I hear this so much and I appreciate it so much in our network, but there's this context of R&D, rip off and duplicate, right, within Main Street. We see a great program somewhere and we take it back and we want to uh, put it into action in our communities. 
that doesn't necessarily work in this context because everything is hyper-localized, right? You need to think about what it actually means in your community, in your jurisdiction, your county, your state, the region, whatever, whatever the places that you're trying to create this change in, there's probably a history of the issue there, right? There's a reason that we got to the point that we're at. Um, and it could be those broad historical things, right? Structural ways that things came into creation. But it also could be that, you know, council decided in 2005 that they were not going to allow this type of signage, right? Because of this one advocacy moment that happened years ago. And it's important to maybe uncover that if you can, right? So that can be talking to people who have been around for a while. Um, in, if it were a, a state issue, it could be looking at kind of legislation, right? You can actually, you can, you can research these things. Um, what are the data that you can collect around this? I think, you know, we all know, or I hopefully, hopefully every Main Streeter knows their vacancy rate, right? You probably know how many storefronts downtown are vacant. But like, let's, you know, if that's an issue that you're working on, let's take it to the next step. What's the square footage? What are the possible rents? Who's not collecting money because of that? Utilities, et cetera. There's more to extrapolate potentially. Lost tax revenue, right? So think about maybe all the data you could collect, but again, you know, be strategic. You don't want to, you want to make sure that you're spending time on the things that are going to be most important and data can go wild. So um, I'll also note when we're talking about data, that's a great place if you have like a, a college, right? If you have a, a, a group in your community that's a, an educational, you know, um, arm, right? That that can be somebody that can really, really help you if it's something that's it's hyper localized. Um, so data is going to tell you about economic and social impacts as well, right? And how can you formulate that data into making that case, right? So you have all this data and then you say, you know, every storefront, the average storefront in our downtown that's vacant creates this economic impact on the community, right? X tax dollars lost, X, right? X um, uh, square footage not utilized, right? X number of feet not coming into the community. Those are all ways that you can kind of associate that economic impact into kind of a, a business case. Um, and think about the map here. Who are the groups and organizations that are also active in this space that you need to engage? We'll talk about coalition building, but before you would even get people on board with your coalition, you got to understand, right? If the preservation group has worked on this 10 years ago, maybe they had some sort of change in their organization that hasn't been as hot button for them, but they did work on this. They're going to want to know about what you're doing, right? So, so make sure that you're kind of spreading around that, you know, Main Street's probably not the only active person on a lot of these issues. And then think about, that's, that was the, the local, right? Like what, what you've got going on hyper local. Now take it back and, and think about where where the uh, there are best practices in other communities, right? Again, this is kind of more of the rip off and duplicate part, but if you understand your local context and then you kind of meld it with some best practices, you'll find maybe a happy medium. So I think a fantastic way to do this is to ask other Main Streeters, you know, on the point. And of course, I'm sure you all, well, I don't actually know, but a lot of different Main Street groups have, there's different Facebook groups out there, right, that you can also ask questions on. Um, you know, Main Street America has the point. Lots of questions are asked there about, you know, best practices in other communities. Maybe you find somebody who uh, works with you. If it's a very specific issue, never fear reaching out to us. Like our director of research can pinpoint maybe the 10 other communities that have the same kind of demographics and size as yours and just, you know, help you figure out who the maybe best, best uh, points of contact would be. But look to other organizations too. There's Strong Towns, Congress for New Urbanism, Smart Growth America, Next City. Those are just a few, but you want to think about, you know, um, just go going through a few of those places and looking for those kind of comparative examples, right? And then literally create a Google alert and follow the newsy items on this topic, right? Because things are going to come up. And if you're just kind of aware of like, okay, somebody else is taking action on this, you might be able to follow along with them, partner with them. Okay. So you're, you're thinking through all that and then you're kind of formulating solutions, right? What is it that you want to see exactly in your community? I just be careful here, right? Like you want to find the solution for you and essentially you're creating policy. I wouldn't worry about it to the extent that like you have to write it in legalese, right? You just want to be able to say, if you, if you, if you see policy created, if you work with a decision maker to create something, 
does this track, is it right for your community? Because you've had this experience with research and understanding, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But you also wanna be flexible. You don't wanna overwork the idea to the extent that you're inflexible. Um, because when you are working with others on, on kind of these issues, you're gonna find that there are creative ideas coming from other places too. And so you wanna be open to the other groups kind of having their own perspectives. But it's important, again, to like kind of fully understand that issue that you're working towards. Okay, next. Um, and again, these are not like all of these intermix, right? So I wanna say like, once you have this idea of what you want to achieve, I'm saying this in kind of a, a process oriented way, but it's obviously a little bit, a little bit intermixed, but you don't want to, you want to keep in mind that you should have smart goals for any type of effort you're going to create around this, right? So maybe you've done a lot of research around uh, code enforcement in your community, right? You think you have an idea. There's lots of other people that are going to be working in this space, but you now you've decided potentially that your goal is to convene people around it. Maybe that's the, the starting point, right? Um, we want to make sure whenever we're creating any sort of goal for advocacy or outreach that it is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, i.e. Not, not mission creep, right? This doesn't have um, you going and doing something that's completely untied to your organization. And that has some form of timing. If you don't meet the time goal, that, that can be okay, right? But if you don't have any sort of time goal, you can't set any sort of standard for yourself, right? Um, but the other thing is, you know, we have to understand, um, going back to achievable, that this stuff takes time, right? This takes a lot of your organizational time. So you really want to determine, again, with that, that board understanding whether or not, you know, everybody's agreed that this is, this is the action that is important to Main Street. So it takes resources. A lot of the time, the resources for this are not necessarily something that is, um, you know, it's not like you're going to find a grant for it most of the time, right? Sometimes you can, but this is kind of resources that just come out of the general organizational pot. And I want to also emphasize something that Main Street America is working towards. And so I'm sharing with you because this is what we're doing ourselves. It's to think about smarty goals. So if you're thinking about goals, think about adding an IE at the end of SMART. So like Smarties, like the candy, right? And I always like thinking about that because I used to love this. But can your goals also be inclusive and equitable, right? So the very simple way to, to frame that is just to add to the question at the end of this, who is this possibly impacting? <clears throat> who is possibly being harmed by this, right? Um, or, you know, who hasn't been included in this conversation before that we can include going forward? Um, so think about ways that that might be relevant uh, in your community with the goal that you're setting. Okay. okay, process. This is like more my favorite part, but if you have that decision maker, right? They have a job. <laughs> they have a, a, a job probably in, you know, if you're thinking about decision maker, they might be a legislator, they might be an agency representative, they might be a city official, they might be a, a mayor, they, they could be a number of different people, right? Um, and are you, number one, do you have the right target in mind, right? You have to understand the process you're trying to influence in order to understand who the person is, who the target is that you're trying to influence. Who has jurisdiction over this issue? Sometimes you might approach something and you say, okay, well, why can't we levy this tax locally? We need to talk to the mayor about it, but actually it's enabling legislation at the state level. That's the real problem. And you'll discover that when you're doing your research, most likely, right? But you might also say, okay, why, why isn't it, this happening? We need to go talk to a legislator about it. And yeah, you can do that, right? But it actually is just an agency rule, right? It might just be, a, you know, how, um, well, I'll just say from my own experience, it might be somebody like, you know, USDA or something, they have specific rules, right? And I can I can talk to the agency about the rules and there might be a process where I can influence that. It's not necessarily that I need to go to the Senator in that state to influence it, right? So that's important to understand at the top, right? Who is, who is the right person? Uh, doesn't mean that the wrong person can't help you. They very likely could still be influential, but deciding and determining that target is based on exactly what the goal is that you're trying to pursue. So when you 
go through a process to influence a decision, right? Um, you'll you'll find that there are some set standards that are already in place. So understanding and doing a little research on what that process is is also extremely important. You probably are already pretty aware of your local budget process. If you were thinking about something at the state level, the budget process really dictates how a lot of how you know the timeline right is is tied to a, a lot of legislative action right. So that whole process is very important to understand if you were to pursue change there. What's going to happen at a certain date? Are there going to be committee hearings? Are commission meetings? How can we testify at those meetings, right? Um, will there be some sort of departmental review? I'll give you an example, right? We propose um, legislation at the federal level. They, the, it goes to the senator or the house member introduces it. It gets kicked to the committee. The committee can have a hearing on it if they so choose, right? Then it also gets kicked to the agency. The agency is going to comment on it, right? So in most circumstances, it's not that there's just this kind of linear process. It's also that different arms are happening, right? Different people are going to be reviewing your concept or idea. Um, so once you get into that part, you kind of need to know, you know, who is going to be touching base with this and how can we connect with those individuals at the right intervals to, to make a change happen. Okay. So this is like um, my, my very brief version of kind of like a little bit of policy theory, right? So you have a problem, you have identified the issue, you have a proposal or a sense of the solution, right? You need, what we'll talk about next a little bit is people to build support and to avoid roadblocks. Um, and that is that kind of combination of things, the, problem, the policy, the political or the people is what really leads to what they call a policy window, right? So this is a this is a metaphorical window, but it's when you can actually create a change is when these three things kind of come together at the right time in the right place, right? So you can't just um you don't just obviously say your say your problem, right? Like you have to you have to navigate a little bit of terrain in order to get there. Um, and so those are kind of the the important building blocks, and that's also being really understanding of that process. Windows typically align with whatever the city's budget process is, whatever that legislative process is, right? So you want to make sure that you're kind of also navigating towards whatever that set in place process is. Um, and again, with 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 people. So let's talk about coalition building. Um, it is extremely important to again before you before you even think about what your ideal you know solution is to any sort of any sort of issue you know you you want to understand who those other groups are right um and so you you know run and just make that list early on you know and as you go forward I, you know literally when 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 I work on this um we actually we have excel lists and we say when did we contact the person right what was there? Were they a yay or a nay on this? Right. What is the template for outreach? Is there a standard email that we can have or did we phone call with that person? Let's keep track of who the different partners are that we've had in this conversation so that we know and can over time build that build that support mechanism. Right. Um, and, you know, ultimately, if somebody decides to support what you're working on, you're going to want to check off a box that says, yes, we confirm support, right? Um, so that you know that you 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 had that discussion, right? And they and they actually said, yes, we will support because you don't want to ever misrepresent somebody, right? So who are those groups, right? And again, who has been previously left out of this conversation? You can probably build a lot of support from the people who haven't had the, the opportunity to engage previously. Um, I, I think it's great sometimes, particularly if it's a an issue that you have at the local level where you can where you can actually meet one on one with people is just to go out and talk about it. Right. So that you're you're inviting them into the conversation before you tell them this is exactly how we see it. Right. Um, you can then say this is how we see it. And, and you know, you want to also be cognizant of like um, to the extent to which you invite feedback from others, right? There's there's maybe some groups that are so close to it, you do absolutely want their feedback, right? If you're working on that 
um, on, on some sort of um, you know issue about about downtown signage, the pres the preservation group might be a key constituency that you really want to invite their feedback because if not, they might not sign on, right? There might be another group, right? Maybe um, you know maybe a, a a tourism organization that doesn't quite have the same level of desire to provide feedback, and so that's okay. Maybe they maybe they don't, right? Um, but you want to have those meetings and open up that conversation. Um, so once you kind of open up that dialogue um, and you build this little kind of list of supporters, you want to think about, you know, what is it that you're asking of those supporters? Do they, in, in some coalitions, there's, you know, buy-in, right? Everybody has to kick in, you know, a hundred bucks or something so that we can all hire this one graphic designer to make some really great printed materials. That's a that's a real possibility that everybody would come to a agreement like that on saying, yes, we we have these needs um, and we want to pursue this. Um, but, you know, there could also be just kind of a little bit of um, the agreement could be just some folks time, right? That you're going to show up to meetings, that you're going to take uh, any sort of action or make outreach. And, and some folks might not be able to contribute financially, in which case maybe they can only contribute that, their time and, and that is fine, right? Um, depending on how the group agrees. Um, but then you also want to make sure that there is group agreements on actions, right? One, um, you know, is there a name for this coalition, right? Which, um, you know, you could you could go through that process. It's not always necessary, right? Or I wouldn't over I wouldn't overthink it necessarily, um, except you don't want to create a bad acronym, you know. So just watch out for that. We've seen some bad ones. Um, but when will the group be taking collective action, right? So there has to be an agreement. If you're going to bring five different local organizations together and you say we're all working towards this goal, right? Or if you're going to bring all of your statewide main streets together and say we're working towards this goal, right? When is it that it's okay for the group to speak together, right? Does everybody have to does everybody get an opportunity to say no or object, right? To a letter that you might send together? That's um important to to be thinking about. Just to set like a boundary, right? Very quickly. Don't over don't overthink it too much, but just make sure people know what's happening. Okay, so who are these potential partners? You know, I, I keep on talking about preservation organizations because it's like top of mind, but there's also economic development entities out there. There's architects and planners, right? AAA, ULI, they have statewide and sometimes local organizations. Um, you've got obvious, obviously, a, there's a huge connection between Main Street and tourism. So you probably have either a local tourism entity, countywide, definitely state, obviously, and CVBs. Um, there's environmental groups or outdoor recreation organizations, um, realtors and other housing advocates. Realtors need to be able to sell a place. So if the place isn't active and vital um, and there's not fun places that people want to live, that affects their bottom line. They don't want that. <laughs> um, and bankers can be good friends too, right? Um, they they are, aren't nonprofits, right? So they have a profit orientation and they might not take the same action, but they can be really, really helpful sometimes. Um, the other thing, you know, thinking about this, I know Indiana has a great relationship with Indiana Humanities. I've seen them, you know, in your programs before. They're a fantastic organization. I also just highlighted some statewide organizations here just to think about um, you building a coalition is also affecting the policy positions of those organizations, right? So, for example, Accelerate Indiana Municipalities has a whole in their 2022 you know, policy stance has a whole section on uh, quality of life, right? That they want to see, uh, you know, economic development for quality of life. That's what Main Street does, right? So how can we partner with those organizations that are already putting that out there, but maybe just not, um, not they're not aware of our priorities, right? Okay. Um, we're going to talk about opponents in a second. So this is the appropriate time to talk about the 2060-20 rule. Um, and it's an important um, idea to keep in mind when you're going around and engaging folks, right? You're going to find folks that naturally just want to partner with you and it's going to be really easy and you're going to find a certain amount of success immediately, right? Like, great. You know, those are the people that are your natural allies. Pull them into your list. Make sure they're marked down as supportive, right? See what action they're willing to take on your behalf. That's great. 
then you're going to be have those people in the middle of the road that probably need to hear your message first, right? They probably need to see what you're working on, see your talking points, um, you know, and maybe maybe they're totally okay with this. They're just like, this isn't their bread and butter. They're not really necessarily as concerned about it. That's like the middle group, right? So you're going to have to take some action to pull those folks in. Those That's the 60%. But the 20% on the left here, and I know it's awkward because I'm reading it from right to left, but the 20% of people um, on the left are the naysayers, right? So this is a general rule of thumb, right? That it's going to be much more effective, number one, for you to focus on the 20 and the 60 who you can motivate and change than on the 20% that you can't. But for our purposes, we also want to be aware, hyper aware, of the 20% on the left, right? They're gonna focus on the negativity, right? And that means that we need to be aware of opponents, okay? No matter what you do, <laughs> there is somebody who is probably benefiting from the status quo, right? Something about the way the world works makes sense to them. Um, you know, they could be monetizing, frankly, you know, what's happening right now, right? Or it could just be that they don't want to see action taken for some other reason that has nothing to do with the actual issue, but something that would upset something else in their realm, right? But you have to be prepared for somebody to oppose you, right? It's, it's very possible that there's going to be a group that says, no, we don't want that, right? Like, and, and sometimes it could be one of your other coalition partners, right? Like, you could do something to try to increase housing that frankly makes the preservation group mad, right? And it's very possible, right? So just be prepared and understand um, and understand what those what those folks might be doing. So there are, I'll, I'll tell you the resource for this at the end of the presentation, but there are these 10 Ds of opposition. I'm not necessarily gonna go all the way through them because there's 10 of them, but I do wanna highlight a couple because they might be confusing, right? So. If we're looking at deflection, we know what that looks like. Delays, we understand they're going to push away your process, right? Um, discounting would be like minimizing, like this isn't a real issue. We've all heard that before, right? Dulcifying would be um, trying to give you minor concessions, right? So minor remedies that aren't your, aren't your full remedy. So instead of saying, yes, we're going to fund this program fully, they might say, ah, we're going to give you 10% of what you asked for so that you can create a pilot program right? And we'll see how it works for the first year. Um, and that sounds like a reasonable step to, to some, right? But if you, you want to stick with your, stick with your message for as long as possible, right? You might end up in, in, in this moment of concession. But the number one thing um, is to not negotiate against yourself, right? So I really wanted to point that out with the dulcifying, right? And do not no negotiate against yourself, right? If somebody Somebody might offer you a concession and maybe it's a it's kind of a win-win, right? Um, and it's okay to find a win-win and maybe that's where your organization says, yeah, we're good with this, right? But don't go into the room offering, we're okay with this alternative, right? Like stick to your, stick to your bottom line, okay? Um, just lots of experience with that one. And so I will tell you, <laughs> um, but make sure that you really understand that's, again, going back to just having those open discussions with groups from the start, right? What those organizations' positions are, who makes decisions in those organizations that might be opposing you, right? It probably, it, they probably have to take it back to their board too, right? So that opens an opportunity, right? Maybe you're not even talking to the right person. Maybe that person actually isn't empowered to make the decision that they're telling you about, right? Maybe you can ask for them to just steer clear of this rather than being openly opposed, right? That's a possibility. Um, and just try to keep the conversation going as long as possible. I don't mean in that moment, but when you have regular check-ins, the opportunity to check in with that group, it's very easy to let things get to a state where you're going to be kind of, you know, openly in opposition to one another. That's a possibility, right? But you want to make sure that you're keeping terms with that group right keeping keeping the conversation rolling so that you don't get into a, a negativity zone um and again don't negotiate against yourself <laughs> i always uh have these moments where i'm like well maybe we should just do that and um there's others um on on my team who are like absolutely not kelly absolutely not <laughs> and it's important that you might have that person that holds that line for you right that can help be that champion and make sure that you make sure that you don't give in right um on on something that still has uh breathing room 
Okay, so just as like a, a moment of review before we, we jump into this section, right? So you've, you've kind of thought about how your organization can support this. You have really delved into that, to that situation. What is the research that we need to do in order to take this, pro this proposal, this idea forward? Um, you are understanding that you have a goal and you've structured that goal maybe through a work plan, right? Maybe, maybe um, something your organization can support and you know where you're going. You um, understand who the decision maker is, what the process is for getting to that decision maker, right? You've done a little research, you know, on, on, what, the, on what the state of affairs is. You have gathered some allies initially, right? Through research, maybe you're starting your coalition building. Maybe, hopefully you don't know the opposition yet, right? But you might have an inkling of that, maybe being able to respond to it with your messaging. But messaging is something that you're going to be constantly thinking about. So this is kind of our um, our last but most important section. And um, messaging is incredibly important for Main Street, right? So I always try to think about messaging as the problem, the values, and the solution. And I think that this this works um, for you know, you're creating an email, you're creating a one pager, you're creating a website, you're creating a social media post. <laughs> Think about the problem you're trying to solve, how it connects to somebody, and what the solution is, what that person can actually do. And then, okay, Waldo pops up because, you know, if you see Waldo in the mix of all the other things going on in the world, you might be like, okay, where's Waldo? It's my reminder <laughs> to make sure that you situate your organization in that message, right? A decision maker is hearing from hundreds of constituents, hundreds of different people about their problems. Um, at the bare minimum, we want to clarify what we do as Main Street, right? And just say, this is who we are. This is what our organization does. And don't launch into problems and solutions before you just ground them in who you are as an organization, right? So we'll go through these um, a little bit more. Okay, so crafting your message is, again, where's Waldo, establishing who you are, basic details, your mission as an organization, and what your elevator pitch is. And I'm not sure um, to the extent that you all talk about elevator pitches, you know, obviously a popular topic across like all nonprofit organizations, but you need to be able to say, in 30 seconds or a minute, you know, there's different times that might be associated with elevator pitches. But, you know, um, if a decision maker comes to your community to do a tour and you have, you know, five minutes with that person, right? How do you really quickly get out who you are, right? So um, that's really important. And I'll also say on elevator pitches, what I would, what I would encourage is have a board meeting where everybody sits down and pitches to each other, right? Just take a an, an half hour or an hour and have everybody sit down and have, you know, a little panel for each person. And they say, what our Main Street organization does, why our mission is critical, right? In that 30 second time frame, it helps to practice. It takes practice in order to get that right. So um, if you haven't, if you haven't had the ability to do that for yourself, I, I, I'd do it with a group of colleagues. I'd do it with your board. I'd you know, make sure that anybody that's carrying your message has the opportunity to practice what that pitch is. And then a, a, a key tip that I like to offer too, is if you are in conversation, say you get on a phone call with an agency or a decision maker, a legislator, and you, know, you offer that, here's our Main Street community revitalizes the downtown core in X city. And we do so through a preservation-based economic development framework you make your pitch and then you say, are you familiar with our organization, right? You, when you have, if you have the opportunity for an in-person conversation with the decision maker, you want them to also engage with you on it. And so when you ask that question, you might hear back from somebody. Yeah, we're, we know Main Street. They create that great car show downtown. Okay. Yeah, we do do that. Thank you for being so aware. We'd love you to come to the next car show. We'd also love to tell you what we do to help revitalize small businesses and bring new entrepreneurs into downtown. So that's your opportunity to reframe, right? Reframe what their understanding of Main Street was to what you want them to know about Main Street. 
Okay, so then in your message, again, in any format, you want to state the problem. A clear statement of the issue at hand. Use data. You've probably gathered it, you know, from from um, previous discussion, and or you have your your um, re revitalization statistics are a great place to start, right? Um, as data that can help, right? Be concise. Um, and again, we're going to resist the urge to go down the rabbit hole. So, yes, um, funding for facade improvements might be what we're talking about right now. And of course, that has to do with vacancy rates. It has to do with absentee landlord landowners. It has to do with right of ways and downtown conversions and traffic stuff. Don't go there. You want funding for facade improvements. Stay there, right? So just make sure that you do do not go into the whole realm of the problem and, and keep it as focused as possible, right? If they ask a lot of questions, answer them, right? But make sure that you're not overwhelming that. And then convey urgency, right? You you can't, um, nobody's going to take action if there's absolutely no timeline. That comes back to your timed goals, right? But, you know, say, if we don't solve this problem, we're, we're risking X number of local tax dollars every year because you've calculated the vacancy. You know what the other businesses are bringing in tax dollar wise, so you can actually make that case, right? Okay. Um, create a sense of shared values, right? So everybody loves downtown. <laughs> like nobody, no, I, I rarely have, I've never heard from anybody ever. I hate beautiful downtowns. I do not like a walkable place to go get an ice cream. And this is baloney. I would much rather go to the strip mall or the, or the business park, right? Like no one has ever said that, right? But that's your advantage and use it, right? So make sure as, as much as some of that kind of like um, live work play stuff sounds pretty redundant. I would encourage you to connect on that emotional level, particularly if you if you're talking to somebody who also knows that place, right? Or if you can do a little research on the person that you're trying to sway and you can understand where they're from, you can connect it back to their community, right? Like I I don't know where the governor or the lieutenant governor is from, but if they're from a Main Street community, talk about their community, right? Um, but but make sure that you make that connection. It feels maybe um not as it, it might not feel as important, but it is important to remind people why why this is something that we all care about. Um, and then you had a goal, you've already you've established that goal. You you know what your kind of big solution to this problem is. Make sure that you are communicating an action that a person can take. Right. So if that's in talking points, it might be something, you know, saying. Um, support downtown, it could be very broad, right? Or it could be support this legislative proposal, right? Um, you wanna ask for an action, particularly if you're talking to the decision maker directly, don't leave the meeting without a follow-up, right? Make sure that they know that you're gonna come back, you're gonna ask them again if they took a step to help you. Um, and that's their job, right? So make sure that you um, have had that conversation um, with them about what that very specific thing is that they can do and make sure that it's something that they can do. Again, that's where you're trying to make sure that you have the right person in the right jurisdiction for that ask. Okay. Okay, so wanna make sure that we create compelling documents also to share that message. Um, I'm I'm sorry, I've been talking for so long. I told, I told Abby and Abby that I wasn't gonna do this, right? But here I have, I've been talking for so long. I would love to hear from anybody about, if you want, what you find compelling or great about these. This is a, a, it's actually a four pager, but I hear I've cut two pages. This is a general one pager for Boyne City Main Street. They're a Gamza winner in Michigan. Um, and the Michigan Main Street program helps them create these profiles of their communities that act as really great advocacy pieces. And if anybody wants to, you could speak up or chat in and say something that you find, what's good about that? I'm not, we're not gonna do bad necessarily because I don't wanna critique other people's uh, Main Street stuff, but we're gonna focus on the good. If nobody speaks up, I'll just say, but yeah, Andrea, that's right. The data infographics, right? Um, Garrett, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say I used to work in a career office and one thing about like using numbers in your graphics is that numbers break up the monotony of so many words and they draw your attention to those numbers away from like the bulk majority of 
like the written chunks. Right. Absolutely. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I'll say a couple more things. Um, if you couldn't, if you if you can't read this because the text is so tiny, which is probably true, like I can't, right? Um, you can see where life meets lake, which is their their big kind of vision header, right? That's their brand statement. Boyne City Main Street is making a real difference. It sounds like, oh my gosh, that'd be so like, it, it's basic, it's basic, but it's, yes, that is the goal to, to make people understand that it's absolutely the goal, right? Main Street is helping businesses thrive, right? That, yes, that is the goal. You want you like, it just absolutely state, state exactly what you want somebody to know, right? Don't, don't, uh, don't worry too much about uh, uh, about the detail or the nitty gritty in these documents, right? Um, so the stats are good, the callouts are good, little graphics along with the stats are good, images are great. Um, also, any way to break up text is really good, and you might not be able to see it here because it's even it's small on my screen. But they also have a um, a quote from um, from somebody within the community um, that's uh, uh, talking about the value of the Main Street program. So. Those are some of the great things that we want to talk about, right? So um, this is a general perp that that document is very broad, general purpose kind of um, you know uh, one pager, two pager about the community. Um, but um, the way it's organized, it can also be broken up. This isn't actually a four pager, but I've actually been able to pull out two pages that would make complete sense, right? You, you're not missing any information necessarily. Um, but if you're just generally talking about your community, you want to have a really broad sense of, of the data and understanding of this. If you had a more specific policy purpose, right, some, some goal that you're trying to go after, you want to keep that target audience in mind. Compelling, concise headers, bullets, not necessarily. You can use paragraphs a little bit, but you want to stay away from really lengthy um, paragraphs. Storytelling elements. A quote is a great way to just tell a very simple short story. Um, pull back from the jargon and i would say that main street sometimes has very in language that we use right um um and and that isn't necessarily going to help us um and you want to make sure that you are also kind of using the language of the person that you're talking to um and then um it, in a, a document for a specific policy purpose again you want to make that ask right or or give them more information on where they can take a next step use this qr code to visit this website right or um, you know, support X legislative proposal. So um, just a couple of tips on quick tips on design. Canva for nonprofits. Go for it. If you submit your nonprofit 501c3 form, it is free. You can upload your brand colors and um, and you you can have up to I think like 10 team members that are working off of your brand template online. Um, avoid script fonts. I've seen that in some places, and I'm, I don't know why. It, if if we were backed out, like, and and weren't, and we're looking at those headings, and they were script, we wouldn't be able to read them well. Um, make sure to stay aligned with your brand, and and think about the color wheel. If you throw too many different colors into different parts of the document, it becomes really, um, eh, a little bit confusing. Um, uh, there's also a tool called Venage. Um, a v n n a g e that can help you make free infographics. So if you're looking to say, you know, where your downtown revenues come from, that that online tool could help you. I wouldn't use them for the full design of your one pager. I'd cut out a vintage and then put it into Canva. But you can you can um, look at how they can help you with that. And then um, white space is good. Um, just as Garrett was talking about breaking up with those graphics, it's also okay to not fill every little part of the margin of the page, right? Um, and and uh, allow a little bit of space for the eye, right? To, to rest on the important points. Okay, finally, tips on outreach. Um, utilize the grass, grass roots and grass tops. Um, so again, that's that your base and then also those people on your board who can make those connections. Focus on one issue at a time. We've talked about that. Don't go down the rabbit hole. Um, make sure your team is aligned. Um, if you have a meeting, pre-game the meeting, right? Like if you have three people talking to a decision maker, host a 15 minute chat beforehand that says, who's gonna take the lead on this? Who's gonna make the pitch? Who's gonna answer questions? You need to know the rules so you don't talk over each other. That sounds so bad to somebody. Do a little research uh, in advance of any meeting to understand the decision maker, right? Um, 
there's so much online about people these days, right? Don't be creepy, but also like know who you're talking to, um, whether or not they might be receptive to this. Um, do not underestimate staff relationships, right? So if you're talking to, if you can't get to the mayor, but you can talk to a member of his staff, do not overlook that as, a, as an opportunity. Um, never lie. Uh, and if you don't know something, just say you'll follow up, right? If you need to get more data, get more data. If you can't get the data, say that's not possible to understand, right? Um, be thankful, right? Be grateful for their time. Um, be courteous and um, leave with a next step commitment. Did, if, it, if the person says, no, I can't support this, say, okay, can we talk about it again? Or, okay, you know, will you come and meet with constituents to talk about it, right? To understand more from our, from our, uh, our board, right? So make sure that you're walking away with something that continue the engagement. Um, just more information if you want to um, delve in a little bit more. The, I, I, I always use the Kansas, uh, Kansas University. Is that what KU is? I'm not really even sure. This website is a community toolbox and they have a lot of resources. It's actually where I pulled some of the opposition stuff from because it's really great framing from it. So use that community toolbox if you ever need to, to go back and delve more into specific parts about policy development, advocacy development. Um, there's actually a whole lot of stuff for just grassroots organizations on there. Um, so highly recommend that if you're looking for like open source resource. It's not specific to Main Street, obviously. Um, we have a five part webinar series on MainStreet.org that goes through a bunch of different topics on advocacy. Um, also, I'm just throwing in the Indiana Landmarks Conference there because I will be there with one of my colleagues from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. If you are facing an issue, interested in advocating for Main Street generally, I would love to meet you there. Um, so if you are so inclined, um, give me a, a shout out. Um, I spelled my own email address wrong there. There's a S at the end of saving places. So um, I guess I wonder how long I've been doing that on this slide, but um, uh, feel free to reach out to me, khummerkauser at savingplaces.org. Um, if you're headed to that conference in South Bend, I would love to see you there um, and talk about this. And I used up absolutely all of our time and I did not mean to. So I'm happy to stick around if anybody has questions um, or wants to talk about it. But wow, that wasn't how that was. I, I was like, oh, there's no way I'm gonna use this whole time. So. All right. I'm no, sorry. you're fine. It was I was so good. Yeah. If anyone has for our last minute or so here, if anyone has any questions, you can either unmute or throw them in the chat before we wrap up. <clears throat> maybe, maybe not. I mean, okay. honestly, I will say that I the thing that stuck out to me the most was the dulcifying aspect like I didn't I haven't thought about that before and that's something I know that in conversations with a lot of our local programs especially when it comes to asking for funding that they'll come back and say like oh okay well they decided they're just going to give us like as needed they told us just to come to them when we need money and it's like that sounds really good in the moment but it it makes me think like okay what would it look like to push a little bit more instead of just being like okay we're good with that you know so that was really yeah interesting. it's it's a huge problem. I've seen it. I, I see it happen all the time in a number of different ways. And I think that it's one of those things that you have to be aware of as to whether or not, again, that that's like a, a compromise and compromise is good and we all have to compromise. Or yeah, if that just means that somebody's brushing you off a little bit and that you need to actually kind of come back at that. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's all been right, super well. fun. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. We appreciate your time. And yeah, as she said, reach out to Kelly if you have specific questions. If you're coming to Preserving Historic Places, we'll be there too, and we can help get you connected to Kelly if you want as well. So yeah, everyone have a great day, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thanks, guys.